Robert, thank you for that very kind in introduction, which has made me feel very old indeed now, um, particularly with the 10 years thing. Um, it's a great honour to come here today. I apologise, I've got a bit of a sore throat and cough, and I do tend to go a bit hoarse, so I'll try and... And I have brought it back from China, if anybody's really worried about these global bugs. So, Robert did a very kind introduction about, about my background, but I, would need, I need to also add that I'm currently also interim chief executive of Heart of England NHS Foundation Trust. I am chief executive of two organisations right now, which is very interesting. The difficulty I find in doing talks like this is quite often I'm trying to talk about things that have happened in parallel in an organisation, but have to talk about them in series. So I'm, the order I'm going to take them in things happen simultaneously but I've got to talk about them so, um, in sequence. So I'm going to talk about what we've done at UHB, how we've managed to make research and innovation part of the mainstream and then how we, and by this we I mean the wider NHS, can improve further. So first of all, in Birmingham it is always sunny and for, for you who are based in the grey London this is a blue sky and this, this is um, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Robert's done some facts about the trust, so I won't go through them all again, but we're a substantially um, sized teaching trust in the Midlands. Importantly, since we're talking about efficiency today, we've been financially stable for as long as I can remember and before. And before anyone says, but you've got a deficit this year, it's a planned deficit covered by internal reserves. We don't need a bailout, and I think um, it, was, it was done um, in a proper planned way. And we are viewed as a high-quality organisation in that we've been asked to support other failing organisations. And so far, we've budded four struggling trusts, and now we're doing Heart of England, which has had clinical and financial problems. So we are viewed as being quite strong and quite efficient in that way. I was appointed as Chief Exec in 2006, which makes the sums very easy, because that is 10 years ago. But I've been 14 years in the trust, but it was quite an interesting exercise when I looked at my whole executive team and found that they've got 110 years experience as executives and have been 129 years in the trust between them. And I think that's really important because I think that stability is what helps you deliver success when people are going to see a plan through. It enabled us in 2006 to develop and deliver a 10-year strategy and we've delivered it now. To be honest, we delivered the 10-year strategy in four years, but that's not the point of the story. The point is we were there to see it through. And I think also for clinicians who get a job now at the age of about 30 and are expected to work till about 80 now, I think, is the current pension age, then actually people who come and go after every two years don't manage to see things through. And I don't think they have the credibility with the clinical staff in the organisation. But I think when people are there and they're committed to the long term, you work far better as a team. So in 2006, we came together as a new team. So what were we going to have as our strategy? So first of all, it obviously had to be centred on quality of care, really important. But how were we going to define and measure that? We undertook a widespread consultation. Now, I'm not a great fan of consultation for the sake of it. I like the Henry Ford quote. If you ask the public what they want, they'd say a faster horse. And sometimes it's our job as leaders and clinical people to actually say there's this new thing on offer. But we came up with the strap line, we wanted to do the best. And, and that sounds very, very simple, but it took a lot of thrashing out with the clinical staff and the patients. But as part of that, we decided we wished to reduce errors to a minimum. Now. How we define errors in the NHS is, um, I think, um, problematic. We define a serious error as one that causes harm to a patient, but if the same error doesn't cause harm to a patient, it's not serious. So, for example, if you give the wrong blood and a patient suffers a significant effect, it's serious, and if the patient has no ill effect, it's not. I think the same error is as serious no matter what the outcome of it is. So we wanted to reduce all errors to a minimum, no matter how insignificant they might seem, and came up with a concept of what we call precision of care, that if, we, if something should be done, and should be done appropriately, we expect it to be done, and if something shouldn't be done, we expect it not to be, which is, you know, obviously, in Monty Python's words, stating that, be obvious. And I'm also a great fan of get it right first time. So, in all of this, what is quality? And at the time we were setting off doing this, there were an awful lot of people around 
who saw themselves as quality people. They were quality facilitators, they were quality project managers, they were quality everything else. And in my experience, they spent a lot of time blaming clinical staff for not doing what they wanted them to do. And actually, quality isn't a cute and fluffy offline thing. It's mainstream, it's part of what everybody does, and it's hard-edged and very serious. If we get quality wrong, then patients suffer serious consequences. And I don't believe you can take it offline. It's part of everybody's job. It's part of everybody's remit. Now, we've had some problems with this in the past, of people come and say, which non-exec's responsible for quality? And we say, well, they all are. And they'll say, no, 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 which one's got that? No, no, everybody's responsible for quality. Who's responsible for quality in the execs? I am, he is, she is. It's everybody's remit. But I also believe that staff come into healthcare because they want to do a good job. And I get quite tired of demonizing certain staff groups. Very few people want to come into work to do a bad job or be lazy or do, you know, do something wrong. Staff want to do a good job. It is my job to make sure that the tiny, tiny minority of people who don't are dealt with. But staff want to do a good job. And it's my job to make sure that we can make it easy for staff to do the right thing. And too often, when we introduce systems from the top, they actually make life more onerous for clinical staff, not less onerous. But the kind of quality that we were measuring or trying to measure at the time at the NHS was difficult to measure because we didn't have lack, we didn't have the right information. So we used proxy measures. So a lot of the times we started using the kind of input measures. So at the time, one of the measures of drug errors was how many pharmacists you employed. Now, I can see why people came up with that, but that does not indicate how many drug errors you made in an organization. So proxy measures were often used and in our view, um, not always very appropriately. So we decided the three dimensions of quality we were interested in were outcome experience. And as I am responsible for a large amount of public money, efficiency and cost effectiveness are really important. I, I command or control, or think I do, a large pot of taxpayers' money. So it's, it's my responsibility to make sure that's done as effectively as possible. But around about 2004, when mid staff spoke, the focus of the NHS seemed to be on the money angle of it. We got the, the triangle distorted. We were looking at efficiency and costs at the expense of the others. We then switched it to looking at patient experience. And so we introduced the friends and family test. And whereas the patient experience is important, it is not the be all and end all. My mother was highly satisfied with her experience at a hospital she went to. She thought the staff were wonderful, the consultant was lovely, but they did the wrong operation and they didn't solve her problem. But she thought it was wonderful. So, you know, this is, it cannot be the be all and end all. It's got to be more about the outcome and the other two are important. But if you get the wrong outcome, the other two um, fade into insignificance really. So we set standards for the expectations of, of, of what we expected staff to deliver in this precision of care and we set standards for that. So how are we going to measure it? So what is essential is real-time information and data fed back to clinical staff. If you go to somebody and say, nine months ago, your juniors weren't prescribing this drug or that drug or whatever, there's always, and it's a pretty valid reason, they weren't doing it because um, my registrar was on leave, um, I had a bad junior, it's, it's all changed now. But actually, if you say to someone, last week this happened, then people start putting it right. Clinical staff just start getting it right and putting it right. And the information system we introduced, we call PICS, Prescribing Information and Communication System. It's not the most nifty title, but it's one we've been using. There's no reason to um, change it. And the nub of this is that this is about how research helps efficiency. This started as a research project in renal medicine. And as it started and it was developing, and it was about making sure people got the right drugs at the right time, um, the, its, uh, its applications in other specialties started to be noticed. So much so that it's now become our main patient care system. And I'm going to talk very briefly, because I could talk for a day about this now, about the benefits we've had from this. So you'll recognise this as a traditional drug chart. So our journey has been from this to this drug chart using handheld tablets. Now this is the system that's now used. 
it's not just a prescribing system to save somebody writing with a biro. It gives support to clinical decisions at the point of care with the patient. So in other words, it stops errors being made. It filters out those errors. But importantly, because every keystroke is logged, it allows analysis and rectification of systematic problems. And I'm going to talk only about one or two of those because time's not going to allow me to do a lot more today. But it's a clear audit trail. You know, how often in the earlier clinical life have you said to somebody who looked at this result, you know, this high potassium or whatever, and everyone denies knowledge? Well, now we can actually say to somebody, well, you open this result at five past seven on the whatever days, and actually you can't. You know it's in front of somebody's eyes, you can't prove they actually read it, but you have a clear audit trail of who did what, when. And for us, it now manages all our inpatients, everything really. Um, drug prescribing administration, lab requests, imaging requests, observations, and more. This is an example of a drug administration chart, clear, legible, um, easy to follow. And this is an example of the observation chart, uh, again, clear. And the thing you can do with this is you will notice here, this is the SO score or the early warning score. And so if somebody here on this made up drug chart has got um, a deranged early warning score, we also now use this to fire off early warning messages to the team. So the critical care outreach team get a message on their dedicated Blackberry saying you need to go to whatever ward we've made up for this mythical patient, Ward 303, straight away. And if they haven't gone within five minutes, it, it escalates that up. So we can really start to, and if you think about efficiency, that's a phone call not made, that's all kinds of things going on, and people respond much more quickly, and we have an audit trail of what's going on with that. So you can hang rules off stuff once you've got it in an IT system. We feed back information to staff live, so at midnight every night, all the data is taken out of the system and put into these dashboards. So at the day we did this screenshot, that would have been live as at midnight last night. And there's a whole pile of information in here, which today I'm not going to go into a, an awful lot. But we constantly monitor these. We have programs set up to monitor and look for outliers and look for aberrations. And then we interrogate it still further. And then we use that as the basis of a conversation with the clinical teams to say about where care wasn't optimal, what went wrong, how can we improve it. And these get updated and revised periodically. They've changed at the moment um, to a different set not spectacularly different, but we do change them based on clinical feedback. But importantly, since we have so much of this data available, we use this on a whole range of things. And one of the things we've done more recently in the past couple of years is look at workforce development. So this is two snapshots of the junior doctor dashboard. This is here showing several um, indicators for a junior doctor. And this is a scatter plot of their prescribing habits. And this one is around an oxaparin. And a very interesting story about this is we can look at when doctors should have prescribed, because we can look at the risk assessment, how often they did. And when they don't prescribe appropriately, we have um, some education clinics set up. Three consultants have got a, whole, a half day a week to actually um, go through this data with the juniors and provide some um, education and support through it. An early example of this was um, a registrar who should have prescribed an oxaparin on 14 occasions and had not done so, and was asked to come and see one of the consultants about it. And when she came in, she was quite belligerent about how dare you say my standards are lower than anybody else's. And when they actually went through it and showed her these examples, then when you've got factual data in front of you, there's nowhere to go. So it was given a bit of education on the rest of it and went away, and came back three months later when of, on all the occasions she should have pres prescribed the drug, she only not prescribed it on one, and that was entirely appropriate. But very interesting was her feedback, because in every other area of performance, this individual had, had improved. So in terms of how long it took to clerk, confidence, and she, the feedback she gave was, in the morning, I used to sit outside in my car, scared of coming in, scared of making some of the decisions, but actually going through this process and having the support of the consultants and helping me educate this has, has really helped me. And we've also seen that out of all those juniors on that scatter plot, we might have only seen maybe 20% of them. But over time, there's a herd effect, and the whole cohort's in performance improves because word spreads around. And performance on, on prescribing and a whole range of things has just dramatically improved by giving this live feedback to people about what can and should happen. 
So we're doing some research around that, and some of the education people are um, looking at, at writing this up. But this is only made possible by having such a system in place. When I went into Heartlands Trust, I was astonished, and I hadn't realised how unused I was to seeing notes trolleys being pushed around, because we just don't have them elsewhere. And you see scenes like this now, but we've gone to this, you know, clear out patients, screens with names on. This is a sample of the outpatient system. We don't have missing notes anymore. It's just a thing of the past. And we've found that we've turned the consulting rooms around so that the patient and doctor sit side by side. And this is an old shot because we've now got two screens where we have the notes or the results up and the x-rays up side by side with the doctor and it's shared. And it's moved to a much different feel to outpatients for, uh, in, in those clinics. And the patient feedback we've had from this has been overwhelmingly absolutely positive. So although the system was developed for quality, it has had so many benefits for efficiency. So some of these I'm going to have talked about, I will talk about patient level, but organisationally, we don't employ huge swathes of medical record staff. We don't need to do that. An important point, because some organisations have done this, we haven't scanned the medical notes either and made them available. The medical notes are still available if anybody asks for them, but the doctors need them, ask for them, in fewer than 5% of, of outpatients they see. So we've not spent millions and millions on scanning notes. But we don't employ massive amounts of money on storing medical records, nor do we employ huge amounts of medical records staff. So we haven't got all that storage and transport bother, and the energy and tracking lost notes. And equally, because every patient is live on a system, we know which patients are in the organisation and which ones are active. So we don't need to employ armies of people going around counting beds. So I've gone to the, my new organisation where there are people who are paid to walk around the hospital every now and again and say, how many discharges today, when are they going, and do all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole pile of support posts we don't need to have with the system. A very small point is we've saved millions in postage. Um, about sending letters, appointments, and all the rest of it, we do it. Well, some patient-led um, benefits are, and now this is going back some time, but it's a good example. So when patients colonize with MRSA, you, you pick it up by swabbing, and if you find that they're colonized, um, you should prescribe the washes and the nasal creams and things. And we found it was taking, on average, 36 hours for junior doctors to write up the decontamination therapy. And that's not because they're lazy or anything else. They're a very busy, very busy group of people. It's a boring, mundane task that intelligent people find difficult. And this is what I mean about IT systems need to make life easy for people. The pathology results are fed directly into the system. So the system knows the patient's been found positive for being colonized with it. So we set up automatic prescribing of the washes and the creams. And this reduced the average time from receipt of path lab to prescription from 36 hours down to five seconds. Now, I like to put 10 seconds max in there just to make it seem worse to the medical director because he's proud of the five seconds. But that um, is a significant reduction. And back then, you can see in 2007, eight, it was the only thing we did that led to a step change in reduction of MRSA. So it, it's making the systems do some of the grunt work that intelligent people find repetitive, boring, and dull to do. Importantly, when you have a system like this, you can control prescribing. Now, you will know as well that appropriate levels of sedation in critical care is really important for outcome, and that having people just sedated enough has better outcomes than if people are well over sedated. So we've put some prompts in the system. The system looks to see if anyone's on sedation. And if they are, we'll say to the nurse, just check the coma score. And so it's led to a significant reduction in the amount of sedation being given in critical care. Side effect is it saves 60% of drug costs. So getting things right for patients, getting it right first time, being most appropriate clinically is really efficient for the organization. And also when it comes to enforced policies, we all know antibiotics should be stopped at five days. So the red line is beforehand, when it relied on people's memory to stop the prescription. The green is the system automatically stops it at five days. People can carry it on if they want to, but you know the area between these two graphs represents a saving in drug. Now antibiotics are not hugely expensive, most of them. So it's not a huge saving, but it's still a saving and it's not a cost. But we're getting it right for patients, we're getting it right first time, and it's making the organization much more efficient. 
How we followed this on then was, if we've got these records electronically, and if patients are looking at them in outpatients, why shouldn't they access their records online from home? So we set up My Health at UHP, and I'm actually a patient on that as well. So what this does is allows patients to access their records. Now, it's not all the records without some kind of filter on it. So um, if anyone's going onto the system, they have a conversation with their consultant about it. And particularly for patients with more chronic diseases, they can monitor their blood results and things over time and see which ways are going. We would never just fire in you know, a, a, an abnormal pathology result that the patient hadn't been counseled, first of all, by a consultant. So you wouldn't suddenly find you know, popping up your tumour markers appearing. But if you are somebody that knows you've got cancer and you're monitoring your tumour markers over time and you've had the discussion with your consultant, then those results are fed in. Now, what this has led to is, and we also give patients lots of information, they give us real-time feedback on what's going on. It's a good platform for them to report their outcome measures. We allow patients to link up with each other, particularly for some of the rarer diseases, anonymously if they wish to. And it's created much more of a partnership approach. But in terms of efficiency, we found the numbers of calls coming through to medical secretaries or to consultants as significantly reduced, and the numbers of appointments patients were requiring has also reduced. Now, you could argue in, in a kind of business model that's not good, but actually um, I don't see any hospital at the moment arguing for, hey, we've got loads of capacity, give us more patients. This has been really helpful in reducing the load, but actually providing much higher quality care for patients. And it has got, we started off with a license for 5,000 patients. We've then gone up to 25,000 patients because it's hugely popular. Patients can share this with GPs, but it's a patient's record. Um, we, we don't fire this, this off to everybody else. And there's a whole pile of info on there for whatever patients want to do. Now we talked about research and this started off as a research project and this is how I think it's helped the whole organisation become more efficient. But we've also added in um, a facility to enable it, it to, to help clinicians add patients to research studies. So we've added a research tab in so it's very easy just with a click to add a patient to a research study and then all the protocols sit underneath that. They're there, the drugs, everything is there to add patients to research and making it very easy to get um, people into and to track it all through. So an example of, of one of the screenshots of adding patients into research. And it also enables us to benchmark and compare. So although mostly we do this internally and look at individual specialties and across the trust, we've also got the data to compare national and international hospitals and let's see where, how we compare against other organisations through our healthy data system. We can look at any trust in the country via its HES data. Um, and enables us to see how we're performing against other organisations. The upshot of this, and I have presented this before, is in the quality approach we've had, um, and we did publish this as a research study, we saw emergency 30-day mortality reduce very significantly in UHB. The top line is um, England. The pink is uh, without UHB, the yellow is with UHB, and green is the UHB graph. And we've seen significant improvements in quality over the whole period, and it continues to do so. Um, part of the issue about this, though, is um, what started it is now mainstream practice, undoubted benefits, and we would never go back. We now have people applying for jobs who say they want to come and work with the system because it's so much easier to do research and it's so much more efficient for the way people work and we continue to develop the system. So if you want to know who's on a ward round, usually um, a more junior member of the team writes up the notes for the ward round. What we do now is on our ID badges have um, those little radio frequency ID badges coming in so actually anyone who stands near enough to the computer will be logged as being there. Now that's quite good because it tells us who the most senior decision maker is there but it also tells the juniors, it gives them a printout of patients with all the conditions they've seen. You know, And in this day and age it is... Um, there are some juniors who never seen a myocardial infarction, so the fact they've not seen one, we can now bleep them to say, actually, we've got one in A&E if you want to come down. And it's very helpful for the juniors for their education, as well as for us knowing who's seen what patient, who was the senior decision maker. But as we wanted to develop what we were doing further, we've gone through several iterations of health policy where we're all supposed to compete and all the rest of it, and we found we needed to work far more with partners. And uh, Robert mentioned before, Birmingham Health Partners. 
and we've done things like collaborate with other organisations to make sure we can bring large-scale trials. So this is um, an example in um, blood cancers, and the Trials Acceleration Programme has linked up a whole pile of other organisations, and it's significantly improved the recruitment of patients to trials across the country over a three-year period, um, working with other people, working with industry. Um, again, we are working a lot around health technology and health devices, and a lot of what we do around the IT is, is very attractive to industry. Um, and there's just some of the things that have happened fairly recently. Um, we've got the Health Technology Centre, a commercial hub, Birmingham Health Partners, and the Institute of Translational Medicine, all working with industry, a lot of SMEs to try and develop um, new technologies um, for patient care. And it's really going very well. And we've converted um, a significant proportion of the old Queen Elizabeth Hospital, together with the University of Birmingham, into the Institute of Healthcare, to, um, the Institute of Translational Medicine and the Healthcare Technology Institute, which is proving to be, um, you're always nervous when you set something new up, but it's proving to be really successful and working really well. So collaboration has got to be part of what we all do. But coming on to this, I believe UHB is success, and we never have to say to the finance director, We've got a new development for PICS, we need to do it. And he won't. He never says, show us the business case. It's proved it's worth time and time and time again. So we never have to justify that in any which way. And I, I don't feel the need to do it either because it, it's so proved itself in terms of what we do. But for all of you, the benefits of research are well known. And you know the benefits of research for the patient are well known, to get evidence-based care, expert, you know, all that kind of stuff, we know that. We know that organisations benefit from having research. Um, I particularly find one of the best things is it's good for recruiting really high quality people. Um, and again, for working in partnership and collaboration. Sometimes we forget the benefits for the economy. Um, it is a significant part of the West Midlands economy is to focus on life sciences. But again, that's part of bringing in a highly educated workforce, developing high value jobs for your economy. But I think sometimes we forget that employment status alone is a significant determinant of health. It's really important. I think as a health organisation, I am concerned with the local economy as well. So we know there are significant benefits. I know it makes real sense to do it, but why don't we do it more often? So how do we do it at UHB? Well, first of all, we made it a priority that research and development was not an added extra. It was part of the board's responsibility and it was integral to everything we did. So was collaboration. When we were developing our strategy 10 years ago, it was quite obvious that you looked at the high quality specialties, ones that were really were leaders in the fields, and they were research active. So they were part of the mainstream. So we asked each clinical specialty to produce its strategy based on clinical quality efficiency, research and education. But then we cre I created an executive director post responsible for research to make sure it really was given a focus and took an operations director. Quite often we take someone who's good at research rather than someone who's good at making things happen within the organization. Raised the profile of it, took, made it the role of the board, gave the board seminars, clinical presentations. We set board performance metrics that the board look at every month. Um, Quite importantly, we made some non-executive director posts specifically appointed, appointed for their research expertise. So we have um, a professor from the university who was um, a big researcher, and we also appointed an ex-medical director of a large pharma company to be non-execs on the board. So now it is an integral part of the trust. It features in our values, our mission statements, and our strategy. I don't like this diagram, but that's sometimes what happens when you ask people to come up with stuff. They come up with stuff you don't like, and then you have to go with it, or why would you ask them to do it? But <laughs> research and innovation are part of the four things there. It's not the worst diagram we've got. Um, and board level per performance metrics, you know, we can see from this that um, we started these back in 2011. Um, it's part of everything we do. Um, and we made it one of the values of the trust. It's, and this is one of our screensavers. Innovation is part of everybody's job. Everybody's got to find a way of doing something. Part of what we do is research and development. Part of what we do is find better ways to look after patients. So in UHB, we're now renewing our 10-year strategy. And I see no reason to not focus on those four elements again. 
interestingly, when you ask in, um, the specialties to develop their um, strategy and you integrate it into trust strategy, it doesn't actually meet the national frameworks we're required to um, write things in these days, but that's somebody else's problem, not mine. But I've talked about that, how good as we are we as a nation, and Robert mentioned this before, we should have a significant advantage in the NHS. Um, we're a national health service, but does it confer the benefits? So I first started getting involved in this some years ago now when the UK percentage of research trials was falling. We had some high profile closures of some of the pharmaceutical companies in the UK and the reputation of the UK as a place to do business for research was falling really. And one example of this that one of my guys gave me was um, loads of new therapies coming along in blood cancers and in, between 2000 and 2005 an organisation called Bloodwise had invested £8 million in early phase trials and recruited six patients in those five years and that was part of the, reset, the kind of reputation we were developing and then there was a lot of things then done to try and address this. One of the issues was we came up with a life sciences strategy in 2011. The Prime Minister came up with a prospectus investing in UK health and life sciences. Biz then came up with its sort of um, partner publication, the strategy for UK life sciences, and the NHS responded with innovation, health and wealth, accelerating adoption and diffusion in the NHS. Prize for the most words. So we had that strategy, and then we had the Chancellor's Plan for Growth, which talked about healthcare and life sciences being crucial to the economic recovery of the country, really, and put in there some kind of metrics to help develop that. I think more importantly at the time, the National Institute of Health Research, an organisation like the um, Office for the Strategic Coordination of Health Research, tried very hard to maintain the government's focus on this and tried very hard to make sure that research was seen as not an added extra, but as integral to the things that this country needed to do for health. And I think was partially successful in that. And I think we have improved a long way, but we've still got an awful long way to go. So why aren't we better? Well. Is it a priority for the NHS? It was got into the operating framework, the constitution and everything else, but as a duty to innovate. But I have to say, in every conversation I've had with commissioning, never once has research or innovation come up, except in a negative way, which was along the lines of, you're not, doing any, you're not wasting any of your scanning time on research, are you? And questions like that, and actually, it's seen as being an intrusive um, obstruction gets in the way. There are competing interests here about getting through as many patients as possible and research being an impediment to that. I think people out there in the NHS get confused between innovation and research, and you know it's not hard really. And sometimes I think there are too many initiatives. You know, we've had AHSNs, we've now got vanguards, but if you were to list all the projects we've had over the years, when actually I don't think it should be seen as a project, it should be part of what we do. And sometimes it's seen as other people's problem. It belongs to the teaching hospitals, it's London, it's Oxbridge, it's Godtrack, it's not for, not for us. And actually, all the publications you see at the moment about the NHS, it's a displaces NHS activity, it's this thing about don't do the strategy. It costs money, and one of the things that was said to me is, um, by, by one of the commissioners, actually, research is done for the clinician's benefit, it's not done for the patient or the trust, which clearly is, is such a distortion of the truth. So it's not a priority. The role of pharma is sometimes demonised. Now, there have been a couple of cases where pharma have not behaved um, entirely as we would have liked, but on the whole, I've found most pharma to be highly responsive, um, and, and you know, trying to do things in the best interests of patients as well. And other boards have little awareness. When we've gone into some of the buddy trusts, they've never once in four, five, six, eight years ever discussed research or innovation or how they're changing the way they look after patients. And when you have restricted funding, there's always a problem that actually this will be seen as an added extra and cut. And other government priorities can sometimes get in the way of this. So the thing that worries me most is the workforce in the NHS. I don't think we're training enough people, we're not educating enough people, and now we can't bring people in. And I've personally had experience of bright young researchers wanting to come to this country and not being able to get a visa. And you know, I think if we restrict students and researchers coming in, it will be to the detriment of this country. I've been in the NHS for over 30 years, and I've been in management for over 20. And I've never once been asked about the importance or how I would focus on research and development or innovation 
in any job. It's never been part of my portfolio till I became a chief executive. And only when I became a chief executive and started really trying to think about what was important for patients and what was important for quality of care did how important research was, but not just for that, but for the running of the whole organization. Did I really, you know, it was a light bulb moment really. And I think at the moment, as we face the problems that we face that are daily in the news, you know, we all know about the demographic issues, we all know about lifestyle and diet and exercise, but we also know about changing patterns of illness and what's happening and globalisation. I mean, you know, I have come back last um, this week from China with a cold, and so people do steer far more clear of me than they would do if I just had a cold from Birmingham. So, you know, and that was... Diseases can be around the world in, in, in you know, less than a day now. So we've got whole piles of problems coming through and our health expenditure is going up. Now partly my belief is health expenditure is going up because we're so successful that people haven't died in their 40s of heart attacks and smoking related diseases. So we have to find new ways of tackling these new problems. So more than ever, we need research to find new ways of dealing with these challenges. And if you look at what some of the big health technology IT companies in Silicon Valley do, they say when times are hard, you need to invest more in research and development. And I'm not certain, in fact, while I am certain, we're not doing that at the moment. So short-term economies, often poor value long-term. I have a director who's not known for his sartorial elegance and was really, really happy one day when he told us he bought a pair of shoes off the internet and he saved 15 to 20 pounds on buying them in the shop. So that 15 to 20 pounds, in week one, he'd spent 35 pounds on taxis because of his blisters and another five pound on blister plasters. And sometimes I think it's a bit like that. We're saving money in the short term, but long term, we're spending a heck of a lot more. And if we don't start looking for new ways of looking, we, we talk a lot about um, hospitals are expensive, therefore care outside of hospitals must be less expensive. We don't know that for sure, and we don't actually know sometimes the best ways to look after people, and we're not doing the right, to my mind, the right levels of research, nor have we got the right incentives in the system to really drive the kind of improvements we need. Many proverbs, you know, I was started with a stitch in time, or don't waste tar on the ship, or whatever that one is. Um, what we haven't got... And what I worry about most is we haven't got a comprehensive cross-governmental strategy. So, I mean, you know, the Home Office's policies need to reflect the policies of biz and the policies of the DH about we need to attract bright young people to come to this country to research these problems, to work with us. And it isn't just about developing new treatments. It is about how the health service runs better, how we provide better treatments for people that can be delivered in a more cost-effective way. And I think if we don't do that... We're going to slip down every possible league table there are, and we're not going to serve the patients in the best way we can. And we need to not pay lip service to it. We've produced a whole pile of documents. You know, if I were to um, get all the documents out that have ever been written about this, it's time and time again we say the same things, and it's about time we did something about it. Research, development are essential, and it is not... It is about the way we run things. It is about efficiency of the NHS. It's about delivering care in the most cost-effective manner. So it's got to be a true priority. And that's, thank you. Sunny again in Birmingham. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, that was a compelling story. And I, I think listening to you, it just sort of makes one wonder why this isn't normal, uh, but I can assure you, for those of you who don't work in the NHS, it isn't normal. Uh, Julie's done a remarkable uh, job in creating uh, that culture in UHB, and congratulations for it. So, uh, we're going to take a few minutes for questions. So, I think there are roving microphones, am I right? Uh, yep, so if you put your hand up and then we'll get a microphone to you. Yeah, Alistair. Alistair Breckenridge, Dame Julie, you've described very clearly the PICS system, which is your electronic health records area, which you've taken 10 years to, to, to build up. What are your views on off-the-shelf electronic health record systems, which many hospitals have or are contemplating buying at present? We've researched a lot of them, and I think, for me, the important factor is why were they developed? And so some of the systems that are in use in this country, and I, in fact I've inherited one of Heart of England, which um, was not developed about quality of patient care, it was developed for another reason. It also requires staff to duplicate and copy stuff over and creates work. And too often, 
IT systems, you get a bright young IT person saying, here's an IT system, change your clinical practice to fit this. Whereas what we've tried to say is, here's how clinicians practice, make IT, make it easier and more efficient. So that would be my judge of them. Um, some of them were creative for billing, some of them were creative for other reasons, and I wouldn't touch them with a the barge pole if you ask me. Um, but, but I just wouldn't. And I think it's difficult because sometimes people think go for the market leader, but sometimes things are the market leader for different reasons than what I personally would want to buy them for. Yeah. Uh, so it's one behind and then two over here. Uh, Jonathan Kay, I'd really like to follow up that question. I, I remember in the National Information Board, if you look at the products that are coming out the National Information Board, and I hope people do, it's very hard to find that language of process improvement, making things easier. And one of the things that's needed in that strategy is how to transfer good processes and good management to the processes. And we fall into, let's buy the new EPR, we do that at a single organisational level. What can we do in the national strategy level to identify what works well and to get more organisations to behave in the way that you're describing long-term team development, helping the clinicians, rather than which system should we be buying? Okay, I might be a bit provocative now. So I actually think that we have created in this culture, in this country, a culture of indecision amongst chief executives because we have national bodies and national people telling people the right thing and people now wait for the answer. So I think Connecting for Health has terrified a lot of people um, and created uh, let's wait to be told from on high what to buy because otherwise we could be blamed and you actually look at places where people have been blamed for where some systems have gone wrong. So I think it's, and I think it's quite difficult. We introduce a, a sort of semi-quasi market into the NHS and expect people to come up with business cases that provide a very um, very sure return on investment and actually you can't do that always with systems like this. Sometimes you have to go with what's right for patients um, and, and so we went for this as a quality system. We didn't realise the efficiency benefits till we were halfway down it. Now, if we were a different health system where we were paying um, premiums to insurance companies, then actually it would pay for itself in terms of that because if you filter out errors at the point and you have far fewer, what I haven't gone into is, you know, our prescribing errors are minimal and all the rest of it, then actually it pays for itself in that way. But I think we have to focus on the quality of it. I think we could use things like sequin money far more um, appropriately than we do at the moment to try and help and incentivise people to do it. But I think the guidance has to come out um, that it's got to be about quality of patient care and not about other things. And don't try and make some quasi-business argument around patient care because it just doesn't work. Yeah. Julie, Chris Edwards, so fantastic lecture, much enjoyed. I mean, you've demonstrated very clearly why your hospital is such a success story, and that's good news. But the question really is, you know, if we look at the big picture in the NHS, as we all know, the NHS is failing. It is going through a really extraordinary period in terms of even the most successful trusts are having problems. And the question I really want to focus on then is, to what extent do you think that the model that we've got is actually right and can in fact be sustained, or are we going to have to move much more to an Alzira type model where primary care and secondary care come much more together? That's the first point. And the second point is, whether you t take a hospital, for example, and you have a system like the PBR system, is this really a, a sensible way of running things when one's looking at a, a way, in fact, which means that you've got to get people into hospital for the hospital to actually to get the money? You're right, it's failing, and I think a lot of it is down to failure of leadership at every single level. I think um, there's generally between 10 and 15 percent of chief executive jobs vacant, and I would also say that some of the jobs that aren't vacant should be because they're filled by people who are grossly incompetent at doing the job that they've been employed to do. Um, and there are people around, I mean I have actually met one who said, I've made a career out of never making a decision. Now, you know, they shouldn't just be fired, there's nothing, anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and we've created a culture of people who are terrified of decisions, because no deci you can't be held to account for no decision, you can be held to account for a bad one. So I think we've got the leadership model wrong. Um, for some time now I think I've been saying we probably need to spread um, some people around um, over more organisations. I am a strong fan of joining up primary and secondary healthcare. You know, if we were inventing healthcare today and we never had, we wouldn't say, well, your disease is primary and yours is secondary and yours is tertiary. It doesn't happen like that. Of course it doesn't work like that. I don't think the financial regime, the PBR only works for 
um, elective operations that are, you know, a one-off thing. So a hip replacement, a knee replacement is fine. Managing people with chronic diseases, no, it doesn't work. So I think we've got the financing wrong, the leadership wrong, and the organisational structure wrong. Apart from that, it's going really well. <laughs> Judy, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, it's great to see the ITM coming on, having been involved at the early stage. Um, to get to where you've got to in the last 10 years, you've had to have clearly driven an agenda around making more data available, um, greater transparency, greater access to that information so that you can present the data you presented today. In terms of where you'd want to be in 10 years down the line, what are the data, what is the information that you're trying to get and provide more access to within your trust? so that you can drive a greater innovation agenda? So I wouldn't actually be the one to do that. It would be the clinical staff who'd say we need to have this data available. Um, what we have created is um, a quite active... So we run um, a quality sort of board for clinical staff on a Wednesday morning from 7 till 9. The last time we had a vacancy came, it's unpaid, and people have to come in at 7 a.m. to do it. And the last time we had a vacancy, we had 40 applicants. So people are really, really keen on doing that, and they come up with the quality measures. So, and if we have a problem, we will focus on something. So at one point, we found out 17% of our inpatients were diabetic, so we started measuring HP1AC. And once we got that fixed, we move on to something else. But the clinical staff come up with that. Um, and it's my job to make sure that people remain energised, focused and want to do that. I, I don't know enough about these kind of things to, to, to say that. But what I do do is monitor who looks at the information. Because I have a dashboard that tells me who's looked at the dashboards. So we've got two questions over here. Julie, tremendous talk. Um, we're about to add to that list of reports about accelerating access to innovation, the AAR report. To the extent that we can tempt you to read it, what would the criteria be that you'll apply about whether that will really make a difference? It depends on your audience. And I have been, um, for, for me, the key group here is the chief executives of the vast majority of hospitals out there who see research isn't their business. And I think we have to make it easy for them because although I wish some of them didn't exist, they do. And therefore, we have to make it easy for them to do the right thing. And we, so I think we almost have to give a noddy guide to the, these are the kind of things you should be looking at. These are the metrics you should be looking at. This is how it will help you run your organisation, be more efficient and help you with the financial challenges. And I think, you, you know, I, I have to say this, the chief executives as a community are problematic. They are, which is why I don't go to any meetings. <laughs> Hi, Adam Roberts from the Health Foundation. Uh, two very quick questions. Firstly, based on your experience with Heart of England, um, you may have answered this anyway, but from what you've learned there compared to um, UHB, what's the most important thing that failing organisations should do in the next year or two years? We've and second, sorry, and then second, what's next for hospitals such as UHB? What is the next thing that you will be aiming to? Uh, focus on. So we're continually de developing PICs and actually making it much more comprehensive going into reaches that, that we, we hadn't thought of before and that's coming back from the clinical staff. We've now helped five failing organisations and I have to say that the problems were different in each one and the analogy I've given on this is sometimes when there's a car accident you assume it's the driver but it could be a faulty car, it could be road conditions so when we helped George Elliott Hospital it was a feature of it being in a very small um, town. Now, if there's anyone here from Nuneaton, I'm really sorry, but it's not the most attractive place to go and live. So they had a problem about recruiting the right numbers of staff and, and the whole health economy was a problem there. In Heart of England, the clinical staff are great, they're really fantastic, but they've had not the right um, leadership and um, decisions haven't been made. So one of my earliest things when I went in, I said, why have you had a locum for three years of somebody who's not even qualified to do the job? We paid two and a half times as much. And I said, well, we submitted the business case three years ago and we're still waiting for a decision. So that kind of decision-making, lack of decision-making, um, is a big feature at organisations um, that are currently at Heartlands. And the clinical staff are really responsive and you know, I've been really impressed by them. So that's good. And in other places, it's been very different factors. One of the problems is a lot of failing hospitals are in small towns that are just far enough away from major cities to have a problem with recruitment. So we've helped Hereford, Nuneaton, Burton, Medway all fit that criteria and it's very similar to Midstaff's small town 
but that little bit away from a major conurbation can't recruit staff and I think we need to think about that nationally. So going, going back, I think, before to Chris's question, that might be part of making it part of a bigger organisation and trying to spread the leadership around. Because you, it's easy to, for me to rotate someone from UHB out for a day a week. It's harder to get someone to go and work there full time. Can I thank Julie again very much for her